All right, everyone, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for Understand, Prepare, Share, Connect Gonorrhea Learning Session hosted by HCET with presenters Dr. Laura Quilter, Jamie Black, and Justin Holderman. My name is Brandon Heimbaugh. I'm a project manager at HCET, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Let me briefly introduce you to healthcare education and training. HCET's mission is to provide comprehensive program development education and training to improve reproductive and sexual health outcomes. HCET is an organization of passionate people who are proactive in their belief that access to evidence-based, medically accurate, and reproductive and sexual health education, training, and care is a fundamental right. For more information and to keep up to date with HCET events, please be sure to follow HCET on our various social media platforms and visit our website at hcet.org. For additional training and professional development opportunities, visit our virtual learning website at learn.hcet.org. Now I will quickly review some housekeeping information. A link to complete an event evaluation will be sent to you via email following the webinar. Keeps, here we go. Uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, archived presentations and a list of upcoming events can be viewed on our website. And if you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, please contact Brandon Heinball at the email listed on your screen. In order to receive nursing contact hours for this webinar, participants must attend the entire webinar, complete the event evaluation, and submit the nursing contact hour form to HCET. Throughout the presentation, we encourage you to send your questions via the Q&A box. To submit a question, hover over the icon on the main screen and select the Q&A icon at the bottom. Once selected, the Q&A box should appear on your screen. And then if you wish to have live transcripts, please click on the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitle. Now I would like to introduce you to your presenters for today. Laura Quilter is a medical epidemiologist on the clinical team with the Division of STD Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She joined the CDC as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer with the Division of STD Prevention in 2017. Prior to her arrival at CDC, Dr. Quilter completed her Infectious Disease Fellowship and received her Master of Public Health in Global Health at the University of Washington. She completed her internal medicine residency at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, earned her medical degree from the Indiana University School of Medicine, and received her bachelor's degree from Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Quilter's interests have been focused on public health and STD prevention with prior research experience involving extragenital gonococcal and chlamydial infections, neurosyphilis, and the surveillance of antimicrobial resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. Jamie Black is a Hoosier native who began her career in public health working with both nonprofit organizations and local government agencies in disaster preparedness. She completed her MPH in epidemiology at Sunny Downstate School of Public Health in Brooklyn, New York, and soon after joined Indiana strengthening the U.S. response to resistant gonorrhea surge team at the Indiana Department of Health. As a senior epidemiologist in her division, she now oversees two surveillance focused grants and a team of epidemiologists and investigators. She also currently she also recently became one of 13 epidemiologists chosen for the inaugural Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists Leading Epidemiologists Advancing Data Program. Jamie also holds a Bachelor of Science in Genetic Biology from Purdue University with a minor in Anthropology. And last but not least, Justin Holderman is an epidemiologist with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the Behavioral Science and Epidemiology branch. His background as a frontline disease intervention specialist and STI surveillance supervisor are utilized locally for developing best, pra best practices and during STI outbreak response. After obtaining his MPH from Indiana University, he began at the Department of Health by implementing the local search program and developing data analysis tools. He currently provides technical assistance to the state of Indiana in matters concerning disease intervention, resistant gonorrhea, and is your point of contact for all local concerns of disseminated gonococcal infection. So without further ado, I will be turning things over to Dr. Quilter to get us started.
There you go. Thank you, Brandon. This in presenter mode. Good afternoon. So during this session today, we'll review the gonorrhea epidemic in the United States for historical context. I'll then provide an overview of disseminated gonococcal infections, or DGI. And then we'll review the CDC DGI Dear Colleagues letter that was released late in 2019, as well as sharing results of a phylogenetic survey of DGI isolates. And finally, we'll share some, uh, some of what we've learned about reported DGI cases in Indiana. But first, we'll walk through a clinical case study. So this is a 20-year-old cisgender woman who presents to an emergency department with a rash in her arms, legs, trunk, and scalp that had just erupted that same morning. She also reports feeling generalized muscle aches, fever, and pain in both ankles. And during the sexual history, she reports that two weeks earlier, she engaged in vaginal intercourse with a new male sex partner without barrier protection. She reports no other anatomic sites of exposure and denies vaginal discharge or pain while urination. On physical examination, she has erythematous pustules near the wrist and on the fingers, shown in the picture here. And also these are visualized on her trunk, scalp, and both ankles. There's mild swelling and pain with passive motion in the right ankle and tenosynovitis or pain along the tendons involving the tendons of both ankles, but there's no appreciable joint effusions or fluid around her joints. So you have high suspicion that this is disseminated gonococcal infection. To make the diagnosis of DGI, at what anatomic sites should diagnostic tests be performed before starting treatment for DGI? We'll open up the poll here and give you a minute to answer. Is the answer A, blood, so you obtaining a couple sets of blood cultures, genital testing, so testing of the genital tract with mat and culture if available, the skin lesion, so obtaining gram stain and culture from one of the pustules, or all of the above? I'll give folks a little bit more time. about 10 more seconds. Oh, great, and we'll share the results. And it looks like, um, hopefully you can all see that most people, about 91% of you all um, chose the correct answer. Let's see if I can close out the poll. But the answer was D, all of the above. So blood cultures were collected before starting treatment and her blood cultures ultimately grew gram negative diplococci that are shown here um, at the tip of the arrow on the right. And these were identified as Neisseria gonorrhea to confirm the diagnosis of DGI. Her signs and symptoms rapidly improved and ultimately resolved with treatment. So this case re represents a classic textbook clinical presentation of DGI. And this constellation of signs and symptoms historically has been referred to as the arthritis dermatitis syndrome because of polyarticular tenosynovitis and arthralgias associated with skin lesions. But confirming the diagnosis can be really challenging since blood cultures are only positive in up to 50% of cases with this clinical presentation. So the key take home is that it's important to obtain specimens from all disseminated sites of infection so blood and skin in this case, if available, and also the exposed genital or extragenital sites, known as mucosal sites. And in this case, that was the genital tract. So now we'll transition to review the gonorrhea epidemic in the United States. As you're probably aware, STIs continue to rise in the United States. And per the 2020 CDC STD surveillance report that was just released this past Tuesday, over 670,000 cases of gonorrhea were reported in the United States in 2020 which is a 45% increase since 2016. As background, gonorrhea is caused by the bacterium Neisseria gonorrhea and is transmitted during vaginal, anal, and oral sex. It can also be transmitted to the infant during delivery if the infant is exposed to untreated cervical gonorrhea. The clinical manifestations of uncomplicated gonorrhea include urethritis, presenting with urethral discharge and painful urination. However, it's important to remember that infections at the cervix, pharynx, and rectum are often asymptomatic. This figure shows the United States rates of reported gonorrhea dating back to 1941. 
And so the current increases in gonorrhea can be seen in the context of historically high gonorrhea rates from the 1940s. However, with the advent of penicillin, there were drops in gonorrhea rates. Those followed by increases in the 1960s and early 1970s due to changing demographics, such lemurs and better diagnostics. And then gonorrhea decreased again, but due to national screening, changing demographics, and also the HIV AIDS epidemic in the United States. And since reaching a historic low in 2009, gonorrhea rates have been increasing uh, to the case count of over 670,000 in two, uh, 2020, which was a case rate of 206.5 cases per 100,000 population during 2019 to 2020. I want to call attention to this line graph showing rates of reported cases of gonorrhea in the United States by sex from 2011 to 2020. And during 2019 to 2020, the gonorrhea rate among women increased 14.7% compared to the rate among men, which increased only 6.6%. But looking over the uh, last 10 years, the gonorrhea rate among men has increased 144% compared to the rate among women, which has increased 61.6%. And looking at rates of reported gonorrhea in the United States by state and territory in 2020, there are certainly differences in rates with darker shades of blue representing highest rates per 100,000 population. And you can see here in 2020 that Indiana had a rate of 210 cases per 100,000 population. And as rates of gonorrhea are increasing, it's important to remember that uh, gonorrhea antimicrobial resistance is also a growing threat. Since the dawn of the antibiotic era, Neisseria gonorrhea has developed resistance to each antibiotic used for treatment. And resistance is a concern because it undermines treatment success, increases the risk of complications, and can, and can cripple control efforts by allowing continued transmission of partners. Following the emergence of fluoroquinolone resistance, CDC changed its treatment recommendations to only recommend treatment with cephalosporins. And then in 2010, uh, CDC changed recommendations to treat with dual therapy with azithromycin and ceftriaxone, and at that time, ceftriaxone dose was increased. And then in December of 2020, the gonorrhea treatment recommendations, and this is for uncomplicated gonorrhea in adults and adolescents, were updated, and the recommendation now, you know, is to treat, oh, sorry, is to treat with ceftriaxone alone at an increased dose of 500 milligrams intramuscular once, or for persons weighing um, greater than or equal to 150 kilograms, that's one gram of intramuscular ceftriaxone, with additional treatment for chlamydia if chlamydial infection has not been excluded. And because of this development of antimicrobial resistance to multiple classes of antibiotics, in 2013 and 2019, gonorrhea was designated in the CDC Antibiotic Resistance Threat Report as an urgent threat. And most recently in 2019, it was named as one of five urgent antibiotic resistance threat level pathogens in the United States, along with the following pathogens that are listed here. In addition to the development of antimicrobial resistance, I also wanted to highlight other complications of untreated gonorrhea, including pelvic inflammatory disease, prostatitis and epididymitis, ectopic pregnancies and infertility, Infants exposed to untreated cervical gonorrhea at the time of delivery can develop hyperacute conjunctivitis and blindness. And also gonorrhea and especially repeated rectal infections increases the risk of HIV transmission and acquisition. And gonococcal infections can also become systemic causing disseminated gonococcal infection or DGI, which is my focus today. So now with that background, what's happening with gonorrhea in the United States, we'll do a deep dive specifically into DGI. DJ occurs when Neisseria gonorrhea invades the bloodstream and spreads to distant sites in the body. An infection leads to clinical manifestations such as fever, skin lesions, polyarthralgias, which is experiencing pain in multiple joints, kinosynovitis, which is inflammation of a tendon and the thin protective membrane that surrounds it called the synovial sheath, and septic arthritis, which is infection in the joint. Now, on rare occasions, it can manifest as endocarditis, meningitis, and osteomyelitis. Clinical manifestations historically have been divided into two groups. The first being the triad of polyarthralgias, tenosynovitis, and skin lesions without septic arthritis or periolan arthritis, which is also called the arthritis dermatitis syndrome, as I mentioned during the case study. And historically, this has been described as the most common presentation of DGI. 
the polyarthralgias commonly involving the wrist, the metacarpophalangeal joints, and ankles, which are usually asymmetric. And a distinguishing feature is the migratory nature of the arthralgias. Tenosynovitis is also relatively common and unique to DGI and unusual in other forms of infectious arthritis. The skin lesions have been reported to be common in up to 75% of cases and are typically described as pustular or vesicopustular, though they can be hemorrhagic macules, papules, bullae, and nodules can rarely occur. And usually skin lesions are found on the distal extremities and rarely on the face. Fevers, chills, and malaise may also be reported. And this group of clinical manifestations has also been referred to as the bacteremic stage, since bacteremia has been described in up to 50% of DGA, DGI cases presenting with this syndrome. So it's important to recognize that it's not a continuous bacteremia. And most patients with DGI will have negative blood cultures. And here's the photo from our case study, just as a reminder that although this patient had positive blood cultures, many patients presenting with these clinical manifestations will not. And it's important, again, to obtain specimens from other disseminated sites, if available, and mucosal sites of exposure, such as the urogenital, pharyngeal, and rectal mucosal sites. The other group of clinical manifestations is known as septic or purulent arthritis. And historically, this has been described in less than 50% of patients with DGI. And it typically presents as abrupt onset with pain and swelling in one or more joints. So it's considered monoarticular or oligoarticular septic arthritis. Most commonly involved joints include the distal joints, such as the knees, wrists, and ankles. And on rare occasion, direct extension of the infecting joint can result in osteomyelitis or infection of the bone. Most patients presenting with septic arthritis have not had preceding polyarthralgias, tenosynovitis, or skin lesions, though patients presenting with the polyarthralgia syndrome can develop septic arthritis later in the disease course if it's not recognized and treated. Making the diagnosis of DGI can be challenging. If there's clinical suspicion for DGI, NAT and culture specimens from all exposed mucosal sites, such as the urogenital, pharyngeal, and rectal mucosal sites, should be collected and processed. In addition to NAT and culture specimens from disseminated sites of infection, for example, a pustular skin lesion, synovial fluid, blood, or cerebral spinal fluid. However, cultures from disseminated sites of infection are often negative, and mucosal sites of infection are often asymptomatic and not tested before empiric antimicrobial treatment is started, despite having a higher diagnostic yield. And as a result, DGI is usually a clinical diagnosis without microbiologic confirmation which likely contributes to underdiagnosis and delays in treatment and reporting. Management of DGI cases should be guided by the CDC STI treatment guidelines shown here. Hospitalization and consultation with an infectious disease specialist are recommended for initial therapy, and particularly for persons who may not adhere with treatment, have an uncertain diagnosis, or have purulent synovial effusions or other complications. Initial therapy should be antimicrobial treatment with intravenous ceftriaxone. And please note that this is a higher dose than what is recommended for uncomplicated gonorrhea with a dose, a recommended dose range of one to two grams, depending on the clinical presentation. And the length of treatment for DGI has not been systematically studied and is also based on the clinical presentation and should be, term, be, should be determined in consultation with an infectious disease specialist. And given the emergence of antimicrobial resistant gonorrhea, all Neisseria gonorrhea isolates and DGI cases should be tested for antimicrobial susceptibility, which does require culture. You cannot run AST off of mats. DGI is estimated to account for a very small proportion of all gonococcal infections, approximately 0.5 to 3% of untreated gonococcal infections. However, the data on these estimates are older from the 1970s, 1980s, and may not represent the true or current burden of DGI. Some of the challenges in estimating DGI burden of disease come from the challenges in making the diagnosis, as I previously highlighted. Historical risk factors for DGI have included female gender, recent menstruation, pregnancy, and having a terminal complement deficiency. And just for background, the complement system is part of our immune system, and specifically the terminal pathway of the complement system is involved in defending us against pathogens such as Neisseria gonorrhea. So a terminal complement deficiency predisposes us to these types of infections. And persons receiving echolizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody that inhibits terminal complement activation and is approved for diseases associated with dysregulation of complement activation, might also be at higher risk for DGI. And there have been several DGI case reports among 
patients treated with echolizumab, as well as eight cases per ongoing analysis of FDA adverse event reporting system. Historically, there have been nice year gonorrhea virulence factors and growth factors associated with serum resistance, meaning the organism's ability to resist the killing of act, uh, killing activity of antibodies and complement in normal human serum and increased propensity to cause DGI. For example, poor B1 is an outer membrane foreign protein in Neisseria gonorrhea, and there are two alleles of the gene, including poor B1A, which seems to be more common among DGI isolates compared to urogenital infections. With that being said, there are urogenital uh, gonococcal isolates with poor B1A, so it's not an absolute marker for DGI. And DGI is suspected to result from a multifactorial process in which certain bacterial traits are probably necessary for DGI, but not sufficient, meaning there are strains that cause DGI in some people, but are found circulating among individuals with uncomplicated gonorrhea that don't go on to develop DGI. So the take home message is that we still don't quite understand the full picture of DGI pathogenesis. And there have been questions in past years about if we are seeing changing patterns of DGI, such as a change in the demographics of those with DGI. And there have been limited population-based studies on DGI. However, a retrospective study that was published in 2012 reviewed records of women diagnosed with DGI admitted to a hospital in Dallas, Texas, is over 34 years. And of the 112 women hospitalized for DGI during the study period, the frequency of DGI declined substantively over the 34 years in both non-pregnant and pregnant women, with the green bar graph in this figure showing the decline among pregnant women. Additionally, this figure demonstrates gonococcal infection rates per 100,000 people, with the blue line illustrating a dramatic decline in uncomplicated gonorrhea in the U.S. population since the late 1970s, and the red line illustrating a similar decline occurring in women residing in the state of Texas. So the study suggested that declines of DGI in women paralleled national trends of uncomplicated gonorrhea the limitations are it may not be represented the entire US since this was one state and one county. And the study only reviewed cases among women. But there have also been a couple of studies suggesting that DGI may be increasing among men, though these were outside the United States, one of which was a three year retrospective analysis of DGI cases in France between 2009 and 2011. They identified a total of 21 cases with microbiologic confirmation, and the number of cases increased between 2009 and 2011, though these are small numbers. Interestingly, when looking at cases by gender, 57% of cases were among men. When looking at cases by gender and gender of sex partners, almost half of them identified as gay, bisexual, other men uh, have sex with men, or about 24% of cases. An HIV co-infection was also reported in two cases, so nearly 10%. And again, these are small numbers, but DGI may be more common among individuals living with HIV. But have reported DGI clinical manifestations been changing? When looking at the same study, 66% of all cases had joint involvement, with only 33% diagnosed with tenosynovitis and 19% with skin manifestations. And genital signs were reported in only 23%. And historically, this study does suggest potentially a different pattern of DGI clinical manifestations with higher proportion of cases of septic arthritis compared to the triad. So it's important to keep in mind that they only included cases with microbiologic confirmation, so it's missing cases with negative cultures. So there may be a shift in demographic sociobehavioral factors and predominant presenting clinical manifestations, so there remains a need for more population-based studies. But what about more recently in the United States? Do we have data from national surveillance to tell us more about patterns in DGI? And as I mentioned, the historical estimates of DGI disease burden among those with gonococcal infections may not represent uh, the current burden of DGI, and there are no limitations to current DGI surveillance in the United States. Cases of DGI are currently only reported as gonorrhea cases to CDC, and they can only be reported if there's a positive gonorrhea test. So this doesn't capture the, those with the clinical diagnosis of DGI without a positive laboratory test. For cases that are reported via the National Electronic Telecommunications System for surveillance, known as NATS, Cases of gonorrhea can only be reported with one anatomic site of infection. And in the new STD message mapping guides, multiple anatomic sites of infection can be reported for gonorrhea. However, we know that it'll take time to get all jurisdictions onboarded. And additionally, there's currently no way to indicate if a gonorrhea case is a disseminated infection. When we do hear about cases, case reports are most often analyzed retrospectively or in clusters. So there's limited epidemiological data available on these cases. 
However, in past years, we had heard anecdotal reports from healthcare providers around the country um, that they had been seeing more cases of DGI, and we wanted to develop methodology for how to monitor DGI in the United States. So in 2017, the CDC Division of STD Prevention began a Sentinel DGI surveillance project that has been conducted within the active bacterial core surveillance system, known as ABCs, which is a core component of CDC's Emerging Infections Program. ABCs is a 10-site active laboratory and population-based surveillance system. And the DGI project within ABCs began in 2017, but conducted retrospective uh, reviews on cases going back to 2015 with two jurisdictions, which is now expanded to four jurisdictions that sent gonococcal isolates that have been isolated from sterile sites in hospitals or labs to the CDC um, Division of STD Prevention Lab for AST and whole genome sequencing. In addition, uh, additionally, medical chart data extractions are performed using an ABC's DGI case report form. However, while this form is based on medical record abstraction and lab results, one of the limitations is that we are missing the critical behavioral data obtained from health department investigations. An analysis from the ABC's DGI project was recently published in early 2022, which identified 77 DGI cases during 2015 to 2019 across three participating surveillance areas. There was a low rate overall of DGI with 0.13 cases per 100,000 population. And you can see that rates varied across surveillance areas as shown here although all were quite low. And DGI made up 0.06% of all reported gonorrhea cases reported in the three surveillance areas during this time period. And this, uh, it's notable this now analysis is the largest report on DGI from an active surveillance platform to date. This analysis did reveal a predominance of DGI cases among males with 64% of cases, of which 14% were among gay, bisexual, and other men of sex with men. 68% uh, of cases were non-Hispanic Black, and approximately 49% were 40 years old or greater. And most patients with DGI had no or unknown underlying medical conditions, but approximately 15% were reported to have HIV co-infection. And disseminated sites of infection reported um, were blood or bacteremia in 55%, and synovial fluid or septic arthritis in 40%, and 18% of cases had been diagnosed with a concurrent mucosal infection. Among 29 DGI isolates that were available for AST, all were susceptible to septraxin and suffixing. Limitations of the ABC's DGI surveillance project are that ABC's DGI data likely underestimate the true burden of DGI since we currently exclude clinically identified cases, that is cases without an isolate but have been treated by clinicians for DGI. And furthermore, the surveillance areas are limited to four surveillance areas in three states, so it is not nationally representative, may not be generalizable to the entire U.S. So the analysis of the ABC's data suggests similar changes in uh, DGI epidemiology as these other studies demonstrated. And then in August of 2019, um, our division was notified by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services about a DGI case cluster that was reported in southwest Michigan counties. And the Michigan DGI cluster investigation was a joint investigation with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and Kalamazoo County Health Department. For the Michigan DGI investigation, confirmed cases were determined by isolation of gonorrhea from any sterile site. Probable cases were determined by a positive NAT from mucosal sites of infection in the presence of DGI clinical manifestations. And the cluster of cases was initially defined by overlap in place, time, and social history. From July to December of 2019, there were a total of 17 cases reported, 14 confirmed and three probable, the majority of which were in Kalamazoo County, with the two cases in bordering counties as shown here on the map. And when looking at epidemiologic and socio-behavioral characteristics among cases, almost 60% were male gender, the age range was 16 to 67, with median of 42 years old, there were no immunocompromising conditions known, and approximately one-fourth reported housing instability. 81% reported or tested positive for drug use, with 63% um, reporting methamphetamine use, 19% with opioid use, and 24% with injection drug use. No direct sexual or needle-sharing contacts between cases were identified during this investigation. When looking at clinical characteristics, and these are not mutually exclusive, the majority of these cases presented with septic arthritis, but notable other significant complications included myositis, osteomyelitis, and a case of endocarditis, 
which resulted in open heart surgery and valve replacement. The majority of patients were hospitalized and required invasive surgery, and nearly all received the current CDC recommended therapy for DGI. Notably, 65% were diagnosed with mucosal gonococcal infections, though not all of them were tested at all anatomic sites, exposed anatomic sites, and some may have been negative because the test was performed after receiving the antibiotics. There were 12 DGI isolates available for AST and whole genome sequencing. Michigan performed AST by disc diffusion, um, and they were all found to be susceptible to azithromycin, cefixin, and ceftriaxone. And whole genome sequencing was performed on all 12 by Michigan. The 12 DGI isolates were submitted to CDC for AST by auger dilution, and again, were all found to be susceptible to azithromycin, cefixin, and ceftriaxone. And all DGI sequences were shared with CDC for further bioinformatic analyses, as shown here. So the red box is surrounding the sequences from the 12 DGI cluster isolates. An analysis revealed a highly related cluster of gonococcal isolates associated with DGI cases in Kalamazoo and surrounding counties. And the other isolates shown in this phylogenetic tree were selected non-DGI isolates from the same region as the cluster that Michigan had available to be able to show that these are distinct compared to others in the region. And in response to the Michigan cluster, on December 5th of 2019, the CDC STD division director sent out the CDC DGI Dear Colleague letter to uh, STD programs and public health laboratory directors across the United States to raise awareness about DGI and the ongoing Michigan DGI cluster, and also to provide recommend recommendations to the state and local STD program staff and laboratories, including to consider investigating DGI cases and conducting partner services to report confirmed DGI cases via routine case notifications to notify medical providers and laboratory staff and to submit available DGI culture isolates to CDC for additional testing and to share additional DGI tools and resources. And to better understand the magnitude of DGI in the US and understand if other clusters are occurring, DGI, uh, CDC requested that health departments consider investigating any DGI. And this includes confirmed probable and suspect cases of DGI to ascertain the key demographic, epidemiologic, and clinical factors associated with the case, and also conduct partner services to obtain the socio-behavioral risk factors that may not be otherwise captured and to ensure partner testing and treatment. And as part of partner testing, consider obtaining gonorrhea, NAT, and culture at all sites of sexual exposure as local capacity permits. And then setting of a DGI cluster, consider cluster investigation strategies based on available staffing and resources. Currently, there is no CST case definition for DGI, and DGI cases are reported to CDC as part of routine surveillance for gonococcal infections. However, we provided a working DGI case definition, along with the DGI Dear Colleagues letter, that included the following laboratory criteria for the isolation or detection of Neisseria gonorrhea, either from a disseminated site of infection by culture or from a mucosal site by culture or NAT. And for the case classification, a suspect DGI case is defined as, in the absence of a more likely diagnosis, clinical suspicion of DGI without meeting any of the laboratory criteria is defined on the previous slide. Probable DGI case was defined as clinical manifestations of DGI and isolation or detection of Neisseria gonorrhea from the mucosal site. And a confirmed DGI case was defined as the isolation of Neisseria gonorrhea from the disseminated site of infection. On October 20th of 2020, the DGI case report form shown here became available online to be used to collect the critical data elements we need at CDC to better understand and characterize DGI cases nationally. And this includes information such as case report information, demographics, DGI clinical presentation, clinical course and outcome, the patient's past medical history and social behavioral data and partner information. And completion of the form may require both clinical and epidemiologic staff collaborations as these are data that may need to be abstracted from the medical chart review and DIS interview records. And the form can be completed and submitted to CDC via a secure red cap survey. And we encourage health departments um, to continue to report confirmed DGI cases to, to, to CDC as gonorrhea via routine case notification mechanisms and if reporting via NETS to prioritize the sterile site as the reported specimen source when reporting the case if there are positive laboratory results from multiple anatomic sites. And we encourage state and local health departments to raise awareness about DGI among medical providers as clinicians are crucial to helping us better understand the magnitude of DGI in the US and also identify if clusters of DGI are occurring. Specifically, it's important that clinicians report any laboratory confirmed or clinically suspected cases of DGI 
to the state health department STD program as per state or local reporting requirements, obtain both the NAT and culture specimens at all exposed anatomic sites for patients with suspected DGI. It's particularly important these specimens are obtained before initiating antimicrobial treatment for patients with clinical findings suggested of DGI. And then to ensure that the gonorrhea DGI isolates from disseminated sites and or mucosal sites are submitted to local or state labs and can be forwarded to CDC for comprehensive AST and whole genome sequencing. And since that time, CDC has received isolates from multiple states and conducted a phylogenetic survey of DGI isolates. And the objective of this survey was to understand the diversity of DGI isolates and to explore the extent of genetic genetically related isolate clusters in the US. And to do this, our CDC STD lab colleagues analyzed 45 PGI isolates. These were submitted by seven US states during 2019 to 2020. And you can see the breakdown here on the right, from which they identified three clusters of genetically related DGI isolates. And these DGI isolates represented a total of 12 MLST sequence types. And the majority of strain types, so 66.7% detected, were among the top 25 strain types found in a representative data set of isolate sequence from the CDC's gonococcal isolate surveillance project in 2018. So these were generally common strains that are found among uncomplicated gonococcal and isolates in the United States. And greater than 85% of the sequences cont uh, contain the poor B1A allele that I mentioned earlier. So the authors concluded that gonococcal isolates recovered from DGI cases are genetically diverse and may share similarities with circulating isolates recovered from uncomplicated gonorrhea. And so finally, I, we wanted to share some of the findings from reported DGI cases in Indiana over the last couple of years. So during 2020 to 2022, 27, and this is to date, 27 cases of DGI have been reported in Indiana with 18 confirmed cases and nine probable cases. And this is using the CDC's working case definition. And among these, almost 80% of them were investigated and interviewed by DIS. And you can see here on the map, the geographic distribution of the cases with most cases in central and northern Indiana. And the larger the circle, the more cases in that county. When looking at epidemiologic, behavioral, and clinical characteristics, over 65% identified as cisgender male, and when looking at gender and gender of sex partners, 30% were MSM, 26% were cisgender men who have sex with women only, and 26% were cisgender women who have sex with men only. 70% were among non-Hispanic white. The age range was 15 to, 63, uh, 15 to 63, with a median of 37 years old, and 15% reported methamphetamine use. Most patients with DGI did not report underlying immunosuppression or predisposing medical conditions though 15% of cases were among persons living with HIV. And only 30% of patients with DGI reported mucosal site symptoms at the time of DGI evaluation or within the 30 days prior to evaluation for DGI. When looking at clinical manifestations among cases, and these are not mutually exclusive, the most common clinical manifestations were septic arthritis and polyarthralgias with bacteremia in five cases. Over half of cases were hospitalized, a quarter required surgery, and no deaths were reported. Approximately 80% of cases received IVCEF triaxone and the recommended dosing for DGI. When we looked at mucosal testing in patients with DGI, almost 80% of patients were tested with gonorrhea, uh, for gonorrhea at a mucosal site. So 18 patients were tested at the urogenital site only, with only one patient that was tested at all three um, mucosal sites, pharyngeal, rectal, and urogenital. And there were two patients with mucosal site testing, but unknown what anatomic site. And approximately 50% of those tested were diagnosed with mucosal gonococcal infection. And you can see the breakdown of mucosal infections diagnosed here. So in summary, as rates of gonorrhea continue to increase in the United States, we may see parallel increases in rare clinical presentations such as DGI. And there may be uh, changing um, epidemiology and sociobehavioral characteristics of DGI, which clinicians and public health staff should be aware of. The 2019 Michigan DGI cluster whole genome sequencing results suggested a highly related cluster of gonorrhea isolates associated with DGI cases, though a phylogenetic survey of DGI isolates from multiple states demonstrated genetic diversity and suggests that DGI isolates may share similarities with circulating isolates from uncomplicated gonorrhea. And to help us better understand the magnitude, epidemiology, and genetic characteristics of gonococcal isolates causing DGI in the United States, 
Clinicians who report any DGI case to their health department protocol protocols, obtain NAT and culture specimens at all exposed anatomic sites, and also ensure Neisseria gonorrhea isolates are submitted to local or state labs. And health departments can investigate and conduct partner services for DGI cases and submit available DGI isolates to the CDC STD lab for additional testing. And these are just some available resources, including our 2020 STD surveillance report, which includes many of the figures I shared today and just came out this past Tuesday. The STD Prevention Training Center Clinical Consultation Network, which is a great resource for clinicians and STD program staff to request consultation from STD experts on complex or challenging cases and the 2021 um, CDC STI treatment guidelines, which has an associated app that will hopefully be coming out in the next month or so. These are just some of my acknowledgements. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Quilter. We really appreciate the thorough and in-depth presentation you were able to provide with us today. Um, as you stop sharing and Jamie and Justin get their presentation up and going, I uh, just wanted to remind everyone, um, please feel free to submit any questions um, that you have throughout the presentation utilizing the chat box. Um, we will be holding all questions until the end of the presentation during the Q&A session uh, where you will have a chance to ask um, questions on either presentation that you're going to be seeing. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. And uh, thank you, Laura, for your great presentation. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the gonorrhea lear learning session today. Um, my name is Jamie Black. I'm one of the epidemiologists on the STD surveillance team here in Indiana at the State Health Department. And I'm going to be walking you through the next two steps in the session, preparing and sharing. So in Dr. Quilter's slide, she mentioned the rise of resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea. In my first section, prepare, I'm gonna dive a little bit more into the details about the state of gonorrhea and resistance, um, how we're monitoring the situation here in Indiana, as well as across the country, and some of the next steps and best practices to be aware of in order that the field of public health can be better prepared for the rise of resistance in the US. So first up on the list, what is the state of gonorrhea? In the next few slides, we're gonna discuss trends in the US as well as across the globe. So CDC in conjunction with health departments and labs across the country has been monitoring trends in resistance among Neisseria gonorrhea samples for over 30 years. Like Dr. Coulter said, in 2013, the CDC labeled drug resistant gonorrhea as an urgent public health threat. Last year, when the 2019 STD surveillance report was released, a staggering fact emerged. Half of all gonorrhea infections have resistant to a, resistance to at least one antibiotic. And when you look at the drugs used over the last century to treat gonorrhea, the tricky bug that it is, high proportions of samples had elevated resistance to common antibiotics, such as penicillin, tetracycline, and ciprofloxacin. Looking at azithromycin, which was one of the two drugs used in the treatment regimen for gonorrhea up until recently, the 2019 report illustrated that resistance to this drug was beginning to rise at an alarming rate. Typically, once elevated resistance to a drug is detected in approximately 5% of all samples, then discussions around altering the treatment recommendations begin because anything above this threshold is or will become ineffective against curing gonorrhea. So ultimately, we now have one class of drugs left to treat gonorrhea, which would be cetriaxone and cefixime, both of which are third generation cephalosporins. Unfortunately, there have been cases in the UK recently where patients who had been treated with these same cephalosporins had initially failed to clear their infection. Increasing the dosage as well as strong IV antibiotic use were needed to cure these infections. So it was a pretty close call. With these cases of so-called super gonorrhea popping up just across the pond in England, you have to stop and ask the question, how soon will it be till we see cases in the US? Some scientists predict that international travel may help expedite the spread of resistant gonorrhea in the future. 
This was very evident during the global COVID-19 pandemic as cases spread from country to country via people becoming infected while traveling overseas and bringing the infection back home. This in theory could play a factor in the spread of STDs. As a study in 2010 showed that one in five people engage in sex while traveling in a foreign country. So now that we know more about how much resistance has been seen historically and more recently, the next thing we'll want to know is how are we continuing to monitor the situation? So you may have heard of a program called Surge from some of our past webinars, but just a short refresher for everyone. Surge, which stands for Strengthening the U.S. Response to Resistant Gonorrhea, is a CDC-funded project which partners with state and local agencies to monitor resistance in their areas and help build up staffing and testing capacity in the community. Our program in Indiana consists of myself and my colleague, Justin Holderman, along with our local partnering agency, the Marion County Public Health Department, which includes their STD clinic, the Bellflower Clinic in Indianapolis, and their public health laboratory. So we may have a small program, but we know how to get the job done. Our program aims to test around 1,000 samples a year from patients being seen at the Bellflower Clinic, as well as some non-STD clinic sites in our community that see high numbers of gonorrhea infections, especially in places like emergency rooms. So our newest community site, the Lois and Sydney Eskenazi Emergency Department, will begin collecting samples here in the near future. The samples collected are sent to the Marion County Public Health Lab, where our technician performs antibiotic susceptibility testing, or AST, on gonorrhea cultures for the two main drugs, cetriaxone and cefixime, as well as for azithromycin, using the e-test strip method. We are able to get cultures processed, tested, and resulted back to the program in just three days. This is a huge improvement in result turnaround time, which the SURGE program has been able to develop, especially when compared to the pre-SURGE era, when samples were sent to a regional lab and tested using the auger dilution method, which took two months to receive results back. So now that we've built up the capacity to get quick and effective answers to whether or not a case of gonorrhea has antibiotic resistance, where do we go from here? So to further expand the number of samples that we're testing in Indiana, as well as the geographical areas from which the cases are coming from, we were funded for a second cycle of surge where we're, our focus is to take our established best practices and apply them to additional settings. So essentially to go forth and prosper. So one of the first goals of the expansion was to open up culture and susceptibility testing to sites outside of Surge and outside of Indianapolis. Just this year, we have established the processes for receiving and testing samples from outside agencies. This is especially true when it comes to providers who think they may have a patient that could be a potential treatment failure. This is an ideal situation in which you can utilize the SURGE program's testing capabilities, especially if the facility doesn't have the ability to do antibiotic susceptibility testing locally or even gonorrhea culturing. So under the SURGE program, we have funding to cover the cost of shipping samples from outside agencies into the Marion County Public Health Lab, where our technician can process and test the sample and then send out a final report via secure email or fax directly back to the provider who ordered the test. We're working with our lab to get language added to these reports to help providers interpret the quantitative results as they relate to the amount and level of elevated resistance that's detected, if any. If sites do not have the ability to get a culture sample of gonorrhea, we also have surge culture swabs on hand that can be shipped directly to sites from our partnering warehouse in Indianapolis. To request those supplies and or report suspected treatment failures, you can access the reporting form directly from our Center for Gonorrhea Excellence website. And I included this link um, to the website on our final slide. So the second goal of our program to expand is by utilizing local resources available for genomic testing when it comes to gonorrhea. Through a pilot study that we're in developing in conjunction with the Indiana University Infectious Disease Lab in Indianapolis, we're aiming to test remnant nucleic acid samples from clinics and other labs in, Indi in the Indianapolis area to try and gauge how prevalent resistance is in our region. 
One area of particular focus is detecting a novel mutation combination for high-level resistance to azithromycin among Neisseria gonorrhea infections. So this figure from a paper published by Justin in 2021 indicates the specific mutations that we'll be looking for in our pilot study. This was the first time in history that this combination had been seen. So looking to expand the surveillance of these genetic markers is a groundbreaking project for our program. Now that you know more about the SURGE program and how you can utilize our services to not only enhance the surveillance of antibiotic resistance, but also provide comprehensive care to your patients when it comes to their gonorrhea infections, let's quickly touch on the three main things that you need to know when it comes to testing for and treating gonorrhea. So from collecting samples for over five years now, our program has established that the first step in properly identifying cases of gonorrhea is testing patients at all anatomic sites of exposure. So this means asking those few extra questions when it comes to their sexual practices. So questions like, what types of sex are you having? Do you use your mouth to have sex? Did you know that even if you don't have anal sex, as a person with female anatomy, you can still get rectal gonorrhea by a process known as auto-inoculation? These are just some quick questions to ask your patients. Our website has a provider resource for helping you take a more comprehensive sexual history. Next, we learned from the first five years of surge that antibiotic resistance was most commonly seen among throat infections. This finding was translated into one of the newest recommendations on the CDC's treatment guidelines to collect a test of cure sample on all patients with pharyngeal gonorrhea. The best situation would be to collect both a NAT and culture uh, sample simultaneously between 8 to 10 days after their initial positive result. If you find your patient is still testing positive at the test of cure result, you can contact me directly and we can evaluate the patient for a potential treatment failure. Which leads into the final best practice, reporting potential treatment fail failures as soon as possible. Scenarios in which someone should be considered for a treatment failure include if a patient's symptoms do not resolve within three to five days after appropriate treatment and reporting no sexual contact during the post-treatment follow-up period, or if the patient has a positive test of cure uh, result when no sexual contact is reported during that post-treatment follow-up period, or the th third scenario could be if the patient has a culture done and it's positive on the test of cure, and there's also evidence of decreased susceptibility um, to cephalosporins on AST, regardless of whether they say they had sexual contact in that post-treatment follow-up period. And just a note, the post-treatment follow-up period is typically seven days. So make sure to use the reporting link for treatment failures that, that can be found on our website. Lastly, use the 2021 version of the CDC STI treatment guidelines to adequately treat patients diagnosed with gonorrhea. We're going to go into some further details in the next section about that, but just know that the guidelines are available and have significant changes to the old gonorrhea regimen found in the 2015 version. So now that we've covered how we as a state are preparing for the threat of antibiotic resistant gonorrhea and how you as a healthcare provider can play a role in preparing, let's focus in on those new treatment guidelines and how you can share those recommendations with your fellow colleagues. So to put it simply, one way to prepare for and prevent resistant gonorrhea is to treat smarter. So what does treating smarter actually mean? So as promised, um, here's a snapshot of how the treatment guidelines and recommendations have changed for gonorrhea in the last year. Um, Dr. Quilter touched on this a little bit, but we're going to go into some extra details as well. So now the ideal treatment is 500 milligrams of ceftriaxone. So basically, we lost azithromycin from the regimen, and we upped the dosage from 250 milligrams. Alternatively, if intramuscular medication isn't available, you can use oral cefixime 800 milligrams. This alternative regimen dose also increased in the recommendations from 400 milligrams to 800 milligrams. And then if patients have allergies to cephalosporins, the recommendation for treating them actually hasn't changed. It is still gentamicin 240 milligrams plus azithromycin 2 grams. However, the CDC did note that um, caution 
should be um, you should be cautious when you're treating with gentamicin because this has been proven not to be as effective um, against pharyngeal infections. And when it comes to complicated situations, which Dr. Quilter covered at the beginning, those recommendations have slight differences from the 2015 standards. So on our website, we have a complete list of the original 2015 guidelines side by side with the new 2021 standards. And mark the changes in orange so it's much easier to see how things have changed as a whole. So outside of our website, you might be wondering where can you get a copy of the new treatment guidelines. The CDC website has a wall chart, pocket guide, and full printable PDF versions of the guidelines available for use. I've included the links to each of those here, so when you receive the slide deck at the end of the, today's call, you can access the website resources directly. And one feature that's in development is the mobile app version of the guidelines, seen here in this photo on the right. Until CDC finishes up with the features for the mobile app, they have an interim mobile accessible website that can be used for quick access to treatment recommendations. We will touch on the use of mobile apps here in a, in a couple seconds, so just hang tight. So now that you know how to get the treatment guidelines at your fingertips, the next step is to know how you could be using these treatment guidelines to help prevent the spread of infection. So one statistically proven method is to proactively treat people's sex partners when you're able. Expedited partner therapy, or EPT, is a practice of essentially writing a prescription for a person's sex partner that they can then take with them when they leave your office to help get their partner treated as well, especially if their partner has trouble accessing healthcare. So maybe because they don't have health insurance or they lack transportation or availability to get in to see a provider. In these cases, EPT could be an easy way to not only help prevent the spread of further infection, but it could also prevent your patient from coming back in a month because they've been reinfected by that same partner who never sought care. As you can see from the map, EPT is permissible in 46 states and Indiana is one of those. There are only two caveats when it comes to EPT, but neither of these caveats involve the legality of the medication. Firstly, CDC does not recommend EPT for men who have other male partners. This is due to the opportunity for pharyngeal infection and suffixing not being as effective in clearing that type of infection. Secondly, EPT should not be given for partners who are or who become pregnant due to doxycycline being a part of the regimen. The prescription for EPT for a partner exposed to gonorrhea would be 800 milligrams of oral suffixine. If chlamydia cannot be ruled out for the patient, the partner should also be given the new 2021 recommended chlamydia regimen of doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Again, doxy shouldn't be used for a partner that is or who could become potentially become pregnant. So last on my list for discussion is how we can help you as healthcare providers share best practices with your colleagues and or discuss changes or questions that you might have with others in the field. So we want to know what would be the most easy and efficient way to fit this type of resource into your busy day. So would a, having a mobile app be helpful? Would a website discussion forum be potentially of interest? Um, is there any other ideas that you potentially can think of? So with that being said, I'm gonna pause here to get Brandon to pull up our poll question. Um, and this is gonna to pertain to the methods that we want to see um, you guys potentially use to help discuss these best practices with your colleagues. So there's the, um, a potential mobile application, an online forum, um, and potentially a web-based application that we could monitor at the state level. And give it a, about 30 more seconds. All right, and I think we can 
close the poll, Brandon. So it looks like a mobile application and um, a local or state monitored web-based application are of most interest. So we will take that feedback and we will integrate that um, into our follow-up email after this uh, webinar today. So thank you for helping us with that poll. Uh, we definitely appreciate your feedback. Um, and after, like Brandon was saying earlier at the beginning, know that once the webinar concludes and you get the post-webinar survey, you can also um, leave additional comments if you have any other ideas um, that popped up after we get done talking. Um, and now um, my slides are done, so I'm gonna hand it over to Justin. Okay, let's get everything set up. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Justin Holderman, I'm an epidemiologist here um, with the SURGE program. So I'll be closing us out today uh, with our last portion of the webinar, uh, Connect. So in this section, we will be discussing how providers and public health professionals can connect with the true heroes of the STD world, the disease intervention specialists. What are disease intervention specialists? Uh, DIS or disease intervention spe specialists are the frontline workers for STD prevention, intervention, and services. And it's become uh, quite apparent over the past couple of years, they really are the backbone of public health. Utilizing their skill set has been critical in other public health responses, including Ebola and COVID-19 contact tracing. There are two major components of DIS work. These include case management to ensure patients receive adequate treatment, and the second being uh, they provide partner services to people with STDs, their partners, and others that may be at risk of infection. So what's partner services? The main function of partner services is to inform sex partners of their uh, exposure to an STD or HIV and to offer services. Uh, we tend to focus on sex partners, but DIS also extend these services to social contacts that may benefit from testing. So DIS meet with the patient and conduct interviews through motivational interviewing. Uh, motivational interviewing is a collaborative goal-oriented style of communication with particular attention to the language of change. So DIS work on establishing rapport and trust within their interviews in a judgment-free zone that's pivotal in aiding the patient. Um, aiding the patient, they help in identifying they help the patient identify their own needs um, and help them identify what appropriate resources may be available. Motivational interviewing also assists in analyzing the readiness of a patient for changing behaviors and impl implementing risk reduction strategies. The most important component of partner services is building trust with the patient uh, in order to obtain uh, sexual partner information and to be as honest and uh, as possible. And so thus, everything is confidential. And uh, we take this very seriously with our DIS training. DIS are trained to protect all of the original patient's information when dis discussing exposure periods and treatment options. And when they reach out to partners, no information can be shared that can trace back to the partner. Um, uh, partner services in that motivational interviewing also helps the DIS to link, link patients and contacts to those wraparound services that a patient may need. So how are DIS critical in patient care? With the asymptomatic nature, nature of many STDs, partner services allows asymptomatic partners to receive not just notification of exposure, but preventative testing and treatment if required, all to intervene in the spread of the infection. Partner services also reduces the risks of reinfection from partners by expanding testing and treatment throughout a sexual or social network. Here you can see a real world example of a sexual partner cluster. While many of these may be small groups, you can see how quickly intertwined some networks can become and how a patient may be re-exposed very quickly if all partners are not treated. 
Through our different types of DIS, such as our linkage to care or congenital DIS, we can provide aid to patients in returning to care and services or enrolling in health insurance in the first place and introducing them into the medical community at some of our locations. Um, again, this includes other medical or public health resources as well, including prenatal care, substance use, housing, and other mental health services. So how do DIS uh, play a role in gonorrhea that we've been talking about today? As previously stated, DIS work to ensure all patients are adequately, adequately treated. Uh, this continues to become more and more difficult to manage with the increasing burden of, burden of disease, and we'll touch base on how you can assist that later on. Our surge program has expanded training to DIS to include a better assessment of treatment failures and to identify additional risk factors we, may, uh, we have seen with uh, antimicrobial resistant gonorrhea. This includes travel destinations, as Jamie had mentioned, phone app use, and help, helping us paint a clearer picture and understanding of unnamed partners. So this includes collecting demographic information and other risk factors uh, for patients or for partners, even though we may not actually be able to follow up with them. Through our SUN program, which is um, the STD surveillance network, uh, some of our DIS and other public health investigators are, are trained to understand more about how, why, and where patients are tested for STDs and to better understand the patient experiences, services, and decision making. Lastly, our DIS are scanning surveillance data for DGI cases to conduct those high priority investigations. Uh, they will also be providing assistance to providers and laboratory staff on how to best submit those samples to CDC if a culture is obtained. So what ways can we work better together? Um, DIS are a great resource for clinical and other public health staff to tap into. They're up to date on recommended treatments and are a source of um, contact if you are looking to receive reports on local trends and other local epidemiology. DIS and local jurisdictions have access to previous STD diagnoses, uh, history, including syphilis, that can aid you in more accurate, accurately staging and treating patients. Um, and because of their public health connections, they can also provide um, more indiv individualized follow-up for some patients that are interested in referral services. How does a provider or public health uh, professional uh, help the DIS? Proper and timely reporting of both the laboratory testing and clinical data, including treatment and diagnosis, leads to a more productive intervention. There are many options for, for providers when reporting um, STDs and this clinical data, so please reach out if you have questions and we'll have a link at the end. Another huge asset uh, comes from you as working professionals, either provider or public health, um, giving your patients a heads up that DIS will be reaching out to them and encouraging them to cooperate. The warm handoff that a provider can um, provide goes a long way with patients in trusting the DIS when they do reach out. If they're aware of us calling and they have your support, uh, we're much more likely to be well received and uh, be more beneficial to the patient. Uh, I've also included here a link to go over a little bit more what DIS do and some other public health resources. And so where are DIS located? Um, lastly, DIS are split up into multiple regions across the state. So you can see on this map where you are located in the DIS, um, that is your point of contact. There's also a link to this um, uh, map on our website. Uh, and the DIS in conjunction with those here at IDOH are available and happy to help you in all stages of your STD testing, case management data, and other resources. So that's the end of our presentation. I wanted to thank everybody um, for this. And, and this is the Center for Gonorrhea Excellence website that Jamie had mentioned previously. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin, and to the rest of our presenters. I'm really quickly going to start sharing my screen again. 
Um, just as a general reminder, um, if you have any questions, again, please utilize the chat box um, and you can start submitting, submitting those now for either of our three presenters for today. Uh, we do have a few questions already lined up um, and I'm going to kind of just ask these generally. So um, if you feel like it may be more in your um, wheelhouse to answer between uh, Dr. Quilter, Jamie or Justin, please feel free to unmute and go ahead and respond to those questions. Um, okay, so our first one is, is suffixing uh, as effective as septriaxone? Hey, Brandon, this is Laura Coulter. I can take that one. Um, so the, eight, the 800 milligram oral dose of suffixime um, that Jane mentioned should be considered only as an alternative cephalosporin regimen because it does not provide as high nor as sustained um, blood levels that kill Neisseria um, gonorrhea as the 500 milligram gram IM dose of ceftriaxone. And also it has demonstrated limited efficacy for treatment of pharyngeal gonorrhea. So that's the reason, the rationale why it's, it's an alternative regimen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Quilter. And then another question we had come through the chat. Uh, can azithromycin be given instead of doxycycline for EPT if chlamydia cannot be ruled out? Um, I was going to say that you can always use azithromycin instead of doxy, especially if the patient is pregnant um, or if that's the only thing you have on supply. But just know that like the, the new recommendation is um, moving towards doxy because of the resistance to azithromycin. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, as we're waiting to see if any other folks have any general questions for you all to put in the chat box, I was hoping, um, Jamie and Justin, you could kind of go into a little bit more detail on if you have any information on kind of the development of the Center for Gonorrhea Excellence website, um, what all types of features eventually providers from across the state can utilize this site for, um, and what they should really be focusing on if they have immediate questions regarding, um, you know, treatment or management management and how they can utilize the site um, as it is right now. Yeah, sure. I actually, <laughs> I'm going to pull it up real quick. Is that okay? Can I share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. As well? Let me okay. just stop sharing really quick. Okay. So yeah, this is, <laughs> this is the Center for Gonorrhea Excellence website. It's technically housed within the state health department's um, different web pages in our division. Um, but basically we have a lot of different educational tabs down here. So this is what I was talking about, about the treatment guidelines. I kind of wanted to put them front and center um, just because we get a lot of questions about it um, in, from different local DIS and different providers. Um, so if anything, <laughs> if you wanted to know about treating STDs, they have literally all of them on here. <laughs> um, so if you scroll down, uh, you'll see gonorrhea here. Um, and you can see, I was talking about, um, we put the changes in orange and there's quite a bit of orange in here. Um, so orange indicates a change from the 2015 standard, which is this column here. And then 2021s are in the gray. Um, so then like you can see here, um, the recommended are on the left and then the alternatives are on the right. And that goes all the way down um, through NGU, PID, syphilis. Um, and then there's some little footnotes that you should read. Um, and if, I know it's very, very small, <laughs> but it was a lot of information and I wanted to try to get it all side by side so people could see the changes. Um, and then some other things I talked about during the webinar, um, the Outbreak Preparedness tab has a lot of resources um, related to different projects that we've worked on through Surge over the last five years. So the um, creating of the Outbreak, uh, the Antibac Resistant Gonorrhea Outbreak Response Plan, um, that is featured in the CDC's website now um, because they have a whole section on all the basically all the the materials that we produced um, related to that and also the tabletop exercise that we did 
Um, and so if you ever want to do your own um, scenario, like mock, <laughs> mock uh, resistant gonorrhea outbreak and test to see if your plan can withhold um, the different trials that come with the, the outbreak, then I recommend um, doing that. It was a really great experience. Um, if, and if I clicked on this, it would take you to the CDC's website. Um, but uh, it brought together partners from not only the state health department, but the local health department um, and preparedness, uh, finance, uh, public affairs, um, anything that you would think of like when, um, for example, when FEMA responds to a natural disaster, that's very similar to what, because uh, we used a FEMA template to do the, the mock exercise. So just thinking about um, when, if and when you uh, see a case of resistant gonorrhea, this will help you just think through and, and walk through the steps of what you were gonna do next. Um, and then another cool thing we have is the reporting of the potential treatment failures. So I touched on that a little bit. This is the link that you would use to go to the REDCap survey. I'll actually just go to it so I can show you. Um, you're gonna fill out your information so that I can get back in touch with you. And then you can select any of these um, that you need. So if you wanna report a potential uh, treatment failure in a patient that you have been treating, um, select that. Uh, if you want to talk with our infectious disease expert that we have on staff, um, Dr. Uh, Christine Human at the Bellflower STD Clinic um, is willing to help us in um, if there's some you know tough cases that uh, providers might have some questions on. She's uh, willing to help uh, do some one-on-one um, -on -one consultations about that, and then we can always talk about uh, questions regarding the test of cure. We actually have had had quite a few um, emails and phone calls about, you know, we're doing a test of cure now and it's, we're getting a lot of positives. What does that mean? Um, so I can uh, talk you through those steps and we can figure out if it's a potential treatment failure or not. Um, and then if it is something that might be a treatment failure, maybe might be DGI, we've had crossover in both of those areas. Um, you can fill out the testing and treatment information, and this will help me kind of get a snapshot idea of what we're looking at and um, the level of, of concern that we need to have, not just to be very uh, blunt. <laughs> um, like, is it truly a treatment failure? Do we need to loop in CDC, things like that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, a great resource is our newsletter because we're um, putting a lot of effort into getting resources back to you and back in your hands. Um, so I put out a newsletter quarterly and I upload all the issues and the past issues here. So definitely check them out. Um, they have a lot of good information in those. Um, but other than that, I don't have anything. Justin, would you like to add some stuff? Uh, I don't think so. That was a uh, pretty thorough. Um, if you, if there are other resources that you that providers or public health professionals would consider helpful, I would say um, please reach out because um, we're always open to suggestions and um, can always add it. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, there was a few other questions that popped up in the chat um, through as you were going through the website, Jamie. Uh, really quickly, I would like to address um, something regarding the continuing nursing education form uh, that will be sent out um, along with the event evaluation um, after our uh, presentation ends today. So that link will be included and then you will just send that back to us here at HCET. Once you're able to take the evaluation and fill out the form, it will get you all taken care of. Other than that, uh, the only other question I saw come through, and I think this may be more geared towards your uh, specific knowledge, Dr. Quilter, is do you have any information yet on when the 2021 treatment guidelines pocket edition will be available again to order? Hey, Brandon. Um, I actually do not, and I don't think I realized it wasn't available to order right now, but that's something I can follow up on. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. 
And if there are no other questions, I did want to point out that Jamie did insert the link to the website. She was just walking you all through into the chat. If you are interested in diving into that a little bit deeper, again, that'll have some great resources for everybody moving forward. Um, and then on to our event evaluation talk. Um, a link or more so an email you will all receive after today's event is over with. Again, we'll have a link to our evaluation. I also just put the link in the chat as well as if you um, like QR codes, you can scan the current QR code that is on your screen. Uh, we greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, that event evaluation will also include, as Jamie stated earlier, um, an option for you all to kind of give some additional input um, and feedback on how you would kind of like to go about utilizing a program or an application um, to help with the treatment and management and just overall kind of conversation here around the state with other providers on uh, complicated gonorrhea cases moving forward. And then outside of that, um, if you would like to continue learning more and if you enjoyed today's presentation, you are um, always feel free to visit learn.htet.org to continue your learning. We have several available courses, including sexual health concepts, uh, one and two, it's a series, an LGBTQ plus inclusion series, and then an introduction to facilitation if you are on more of the health education side of things. And outside of that, I just wanted to, oh, it looks like we have one other question before we end today. Um, with the increase in cases over time, has there been a significant increase in any particular age groups uh, looking at age targeted education? Um, if this is specifically just related to gonorrhea in general, I can say that we were just looking at um, our surveillance snapshot in Indiana and um, the highest morbidity um, age group is 19 to 25, I believe. It's um, basically just, it's young adults. Um, so any type of education around um, that age group or maybe where uh, those types that age group is seeking care, that would be beneficial. Um, so potentially more primary care focused or urgent care settings and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, and then actually we have one more, I believe, since there's no case definition for DGI, does the Indiana Department of Health create its own logic um, to count them, maybe using SAS, SQL, or any other type of programs like that? Yeah, I can handle that one. So currently, um, we are using the CDC working definition that Dr. Coulter had presented. Um, we are using both our DIS as they're reviewing cases and trying to develop more of a back-end way to query some of the data. We are experiencing, um, it, we need to clean, find a better way to clean the data because we're, it's, it's kind of, uh, some labs are not reporting properly. So we're getting a little over estimates. So we are working on it. Great, thank you, Justin. All right, so I think that will wrap us up for today. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters, um, the PDF version of today's uh, presentations will also be included in the post event email that you will get here shortly um, and their contact information is included in there. So please feel free to reach out as they said. Um, but outside of that, we really appreciate your time and consideration and joining us today and hope that you all had a lovely time at the, at the event. So um, I will stop sharing now and you are all free to grow. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.